everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Paidea Today. I am Dr. Bill Friesen, and I am joined here by my colleague, Dr. Scott Masson. And today we are going to be talking about one of the most renowned authors in Western literary history, uh, by whom I mean, of course, Tolstoy. And we're not looking at one of the gigantic magisterial works of Tolstoy like uh, War and Peace. Uh, instead, we've decided to look at a novella. And some people have argued that it is the most famous novella, the best novella ever written. That's up for debate, obviously. Uh, but here again, I mean the death of Ivan Illich, an absolutely fascinating story. And this is a story that you and I have taught on numerous occasions, correct, Dr. Masson? I, yes, I teach it every year now and have, have done for a decade or so. It's typically a, a, a novella which either my class really picks up on and becomes incredibly interested in or which completely baffles them. And it doesn't baffle them because it's a particularly complicated story in terms of its architecture. Well, there's something to say on that front, uh, but rather the motifs and themes that it picks up um, are very challenging, especially for a student body, I would think, who derive primarily from middle-class sensibilities, things of this nature. So. We have discussions about authenticity. We have uh, discussions uh, that arise from this text that deal with notions of success and ambition. Uh, we have um, discussions here that arise regarding materialism and material culture uh, and the threat of nihilism. We spoke about this the other week uh, when we were dealing with Dostoevsky. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this story. Uh, usually, where do you pick up with discussions of this story, Dr. Masson? Uh, more or less with what where you've begun, um, it's it's an interesting uh, story. I, I agree with the assessment. Not that I'm a connoisseur of the novella, um, but it seems to me that it's the best novella that I have read, um, and not only because of the way in which it is told. Which again, we're reading it in translation, so I'm I'm simply assuming that it's better in the Russian, um, and and not. Uh, been aided by the translator, although translators can sometimes do great things uh, and make a work a masterpiece unto itself. Um, but more because of the themes and uh, that arise out of it as well. So it's both the telling and the tale that make this a great novella. Um, and it is about the death of Ivan Illich, but really uh, it's the meaning of life, which is the centerpiece of the story. And it really does begin, it's not false advertising, it begins with the death of the protagonist. So in the second paragraph, gentlemen, he said, Ivan Illich is dead, it announces. So it announces, uh, it begins, it's almost like an epic, it begins in the middle of things, um, if, uh, or perhaps at the end of things, and begins with the end. Mm -hmm. And then we go back, there's a backflash to how we got to the point where Ivan Illich was dead, and it turns out that he sought to avoid death at all costs. In fact, the very idea of his own death was repugnant to him, and he sought to avoid it. Never, ever faced it. And in the end, he was not able to avoid the very thing which is, quite frankly, unavoidable. So with that, it makes it a very interesting story. And I compare it and contrast it to the medieval morality play Everyman, in which, again, Everyman is summoned by death. Uh, to meet his maker. Well, we don't get any of that here. There's no death that strides on the stage in a, you know, in a sort of allegorical form, and there is no discussion of a creator that, that's in the background. Uh, it's more experiential in that sense, and, but it is dealing with what constitutes a meaningful life. What does it mean to, be in a, to have an authentic life? Because Ivan Illich believes that he is pursuing that. And in fact, he's doing rather well for himself. He's affluent. He's climbed up the uh, ladder of his uh, legal profession, and uh, he's looking to move on to the next bright, shiny toy. Uh, and then he meets an unfortunate accident, and it all spirals downward. So I, I agree with you. Students are slightly puzzled by it because the very thing that they have been taught to aspire towards is the very thing which Tolstoy is warning us against. Yeah, I think in some senses, the novel was, in its themes, relatively prescient. Uh, 
because indeed the rising middle classes of the 19th and then the 20th century do have this notion of material success and social success, which drives their ambitions, which uh, provides to them life goals uh, of a numerous uh, different sorts. But they tend to be of the sort that you're describing here of Ivan Illich. He's a career man, to be sure. Uh, he doesn't go into his career because he feels that it's a particularly attractive vocation and that this is a noble thing to be doing or anything like that. One almost gets the sense that he does it because he wasn't doing anything else more important at the time. Uh, it's, it's incidental. It's also interesting to me that Ivan does another thing, which many people would say is typical of the middle class uh, citizen of, uh, of the modern age which is that when he's going to school, when he's going through his training, when he's rising up through his company, he learns to ape the manners of successful people. Yep. But he is not himself a successful person in terms of talent. He is good at aping talent. And this is, I think, a very important aspect of understanding who the character is or who Ivan is. Ivan isn't concerned to be talented. He isn't uh, concerned to be doing anything particularly worthwhile or noble with his life. Um, he's kind of just going through the motions. And to me, this is one of the major points I like to make with my students. He does not know why he does what he does. No. He does it largely because the rest of the herd is doing it. And he actually goes out of his way and puts some effort into not thinking about the imminence exactly of it. death. Yes. And the, uh, the meaning of meaning and uh, the meaning of authenticity. What does it mean to live the authentic life? This is a phrase you and I are going to have to use many times in today's podcast. And when speaking to students, oftentimes I'll ask them, OK, well, then what is the meaning of life? And if I don't get some sort of uh, prepackaged cliche back from the student by way of answer, they just kind of laugh. And, you know, that question's too big. So I don't ask it. Well, for the rest of your life, is it going to be too big? So you're not going to ask it? If, you know, maybe you should actually ask the overwhelming question that's dominating the conversation and yet is never articulated. And it's the extraordinary thing is you're being teaching that in general towards uh, an undergraduate constituency. So people that are really at the age and stage when they probably ought to be exploring those sorts of questions, it's not beyond them at that point to consider that. Uh, and they probably find themselves in university in the exact same conditions as Ivan Illich, right? They're there not because they want to be in university per se, but that because it's part of the rites of passage. I'm here because what else am I going to do? <laughs> it's more or less it, right? And because I've been told that the outcomes uh, are better for people who go through university than they are for people who don't go through university. And I want to do better in my life rather than worse. So that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm going to take on the debt load that will also accompany leaving university. And I'm going to, I'm going to balance the risk in it. So uh, I'm doing a calculation that it will materially benefit me, even though uh, I have no other reason for being here. And I don't even see how it's going to materially benefit me. And furthermore, Dr. Masson, you're telling me it isn't, which makes it particularly uh, frustrating is that you're saying that actually you're not here to teach me to earn more money, which is why I thought I was here and what the heck is wrong with you <laughs> and how dare you? Yeah. I had this very conversation this very morning. Um, okay. What is the purpose of education? What is the purpose of knowledge and uh, by way of extension wisdom maybe? And that was exactly the response I got from my students at the front end. Um, I'm here to secure for myself uh, material goods, primarily by way of revenue. I'm here to secure a, an ever enhanced social standing. Uh, and I'm here to secure uh, a degree of security in terms of fiscal and material security in the future. There's nothing wrong with any of those nope. things, I suppose. Nope. But is that first and foremost, the job of knowledge and wisdom? To bring you those things or is it something more purpose uh, something more personal where we ended up going with that conversation was getting into a conversation about relationship and the value of relationship and then that got us somewhere a little bit more productive but this is a common notion you're not wrong this is a perennial sort of a complaint you and i hear when we're talking to a class you know what is the purpose of betterment what is the purpose what do you mean by betterment and uh, I get the same responses that you get, apparently. 
So yeah, and, and so the traditional path of education, which is training and wisdom and virtue, that's traditional education. That's what it is. Yep. Um, it, post 19th century, it's no longer training and wisdom and virtue. That's that's not the purpose of education. The purpose of education is material advancement, and that is in some ways. It's not just that it's at odds with wisdom and virtue. It's that it doesn't even engage with those questions, and it claims to be better at the same time. And the the standard of superiority is the material gains that come with it. Ivan Illich has pursued those goals and he's done rather well out of it for himself. And yet at the same time, he finds himself with this terrible tragic accident um, facing the very thing that he had not only not contemplated, but refused to contemplate, found disgusting yep. that people should raise the very t idea of mortality and yet found that he could not avoid it any longer. And then it, so it forces him and with him, the reader to consider the very things that the culture has said, we're not going to talk about those things, which in the, in the time of COVID seems a rather helpful thing to discuss. Yes, you're right. Um, we need to be clear. This is something, again, I say to my classes, which is that understand here, it's not that people are ignorant of the questions of meaning, authenticity, and uh, and death. It's that they willfully look away from the crisis, the approaching crisis. They put themselves in a state of deep existential denial. And if Ivan has one great overwhelming sin, in my view, it is this. He is in denial on the great issues of life and this is one of the things i find refreshing about some russian literature is they go straight at this problem often they really do yeah and we saw it with dostoevsky as well he pushes in the same direction yes very much in fact i find it fascinating to compare the two authors uh, and their approach to various shared themes i should mention also in passing that uh, these are two in, in other ways these are two very different authors Dostoevsky and Tolstoy very. in that uh, Tolstoy comes out of an extremely well-placed family uh, Tolstoy is about as legitimate Russian Leo. nobility as you can get yeah. yes uh, so when he speaks about uh, aristocracy and aristocratic concerns and things like this uh, he is a, an authority from the inside very much and so in some senses, he's different than Dostoevsky. Uh, and he never suffers a great life crisis. I, uh, that is to say, a life-threatening crisis like Dostoevsky did. Dostoevsky had to face the fake firing squad mm -hmm. and resigned himself to death and all the things that come out of that. And prison camp and so forth. Yep. Yes, and the suffering that comes with that and being marginalized and having your ambitions dashed. Terrible Tol health. Yes, Tolstoy himself never undergoes that. And yet the character in the, the novella does undergo that. The character in the novella, by the way, is considerably lower than Tolstoy, the author's social status. He's a middle-class bureaucrat. He's a magistrate. Um, so I, I find all these things rather interesting. But of course, Ivan comes to that existential crisis the way to Dostoevsky himself came to that existential crisis. Um, so that, so to, to your theme here. Mm -hmm. It's about the meaning of life and the meaning of and the life that Ivan has followed uh, while seemingly rational, commonsensical for him to follow, uh, actually conceals the true meaning of life from him. So it conceals it at the same time he looks away from it, but it, it actually does conceal itself from him. He can't he can't actually see it. This, Where, yes. Whereas when he is confronted with his death for the first time, he something opens up to him that was opaque to him before, and he suddenly finds in the person of one of the individuals who will serve him, a servant by the name of Gerasim, who seems to be a Christian, uh, somebody who's living an authentic life, which is very much living in ways that are incomprehensible to Ivan, and this, uh, and that that path of uh, action that uh, Gerasim follows is one that eventually Ivan will embrace as as the true path. So it's two ways to live. It's the it's the it's the in, in some sense it's like Pro Proverbs one. There's the way um, 
blessed is he who walks uh and and talking about the the wise man and the fool and and he begins as the fool and he's mm -hmm. taught by the wise man but the wise man seems foolish in his eyes so really it's about wisdom and folly yeah i i like your point about how his middle class life and his middle class ambitions serve to uh, as a catalyst by which he can masquerade the true meaning of life and things like this i mentioned at the front end that he learns how to ape successful people and that's very very important he has this crude facsimile uh for the real thing uh he's got a middle class life that uh facilitates aping and imitation everywhere and allows him to escape accountability which would otherwise potentially force him to be authentic a bigger I mean, car if they exist at the time a bigger car a bigger house a, a better location a better job higher pay you name it all these external standards of success those are his standards yes and if our audience has been fortunate enough to read his well i would argue it's his magnum opus uh, war and peace mm -hmm. You'll find him taking on this very crisis on a massive epic scale. Uh, there are a, a pair of characters in War and Peace, and they are struggling to reach authenticity. One of them lives a life of absolute uh, dissipation and ennui, and uh, so he, you know, he's attained all the material goods he can. He's attained all the social standing he can. He's right at the pinnacle, and he finds himself still hungry. What is going on here? And this unloose uh, this unleashes uh, the progress of that novel here so on a smaller scale we have the same sort of crisis going on with with Ivan Ivan here is he's got he's living the dream he's got the big house he's got the wife he's got the what to put it in modern terms like you did here you know he's got the labradoodle he's got the white picket fence and the SUV and, <clears throat> and there he is he's in paradise and it's all turning to ash in his mouth Oh. Uh, it does not satisfy, and it certainly doesn't satisfy in the face of the crisis of death. And this was a middle class problem that a lot of writers and thinkers had on the brain in the 19th century. Oh. Uh, very famously, Kierkegaard said oh. uh, at a certain point, he said, we need to cultivate a continuous awareness of our own imminent death. And so he gives this sort of a jocular example. He says, you know, when you get invited to the party, say, oh, I'd, I'd be delighted to come to the party provided a slate doesn't get blown off of a roof as i'm walking under it and kill me other than that i'll be at your party um so he said you need to be in this state of mind all the time but there were many authors and many philosophers and many thinkers many theologians in the 19th century who become much more keenly aware of the need for the awareness of the imminence of death and how that throws meaning and value and purpose in life into sharp relief. And so I like also what you said about the structure here. You start at the end and then you work your way backwards in the structure of the story. Say a little bit more about the structure of the story because it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, so it be, as I say, the, the novella begins with Ivan's death or the announcement of his death. And it, it's swiftly followed by the funeral and the people that come to the funeral. And then we get the reactions to his death, um, which are very interesting. They range from his friends to his family and so forth. And we get revealed in this uh, something of their attitude towards him, which we would not have known had he not been dead, because now they're not long, they're no longer concealing it. Um, but what I think is really fascinating about the novella it's so it, it it's 12 chapters the first four deal with the first 40 years of Ivan's life more or less so we begin with the death and then we there's a backtracking and how did we get to this point well the first 40 years are the first four chapters the second four chapters span several months the final four chapters about four weeks and in each chapter the chapters get ever shorter and so what we get is a contracting of time but also of space because he goes from in his early 40 years he's traveling a lot he's moving about from the country to eventually, eventually to moscow and so forth and he, he's very much um, on the ascent uh, on the progress of the career ladder moving about as he falls and gets uh, he hurts his hip hurts his side rather uh, from this fall off a ladder he is then confined to his house and eventually to his bed and then the final four chapters deal with a man who can't get off his couch 
and, and so he and he's in chronic pain at that point and he can't escape the pain and he can't escape the couch he can't get off the couch so it's very much uh, almost in itself a microcosm of what happens in a person's life where when they're young they're rel usually usually able-bodied and able to move about and as they grow ever older they become less and less capable of moving around and they become more and more housebound and eventually they may not be able to get out of their bed well that's the case here in the novella and so in the case of this novella really what we have is a microcosm of every person's life and it's about what does it mean to live an authentic life so it's a it really is a novella about uh a, what is wisdom how should we govern our lives in the light of the fact that we're all going to die so it's a memento mori behind you you always have this little skull the little hamlet skull which hamlet himself looks upon to remind him of the fact that he's a human being that he's mortal and that one day he will go the way of all flesh and die and so how ought he to live in the light of that fact well the 19th century doesn't want to ask that question anymore but these authors like tolstoy forces us to encounter it and even does it for us and he does it in i think a poignant way but that but the structuring of the novella pushes the themes to the forefront yeah there's a kind of growing chronological and spatial claustrophobia yes good that point. tolstoy generates yes. and i think a lot of our audience right now can relate to this because we uh we're, we're continuously aware of sickness if not death with uh the with the crisis of covid and many of us have had our spatial environments radically reduced by this we're dealing with quarantines and shut-ins and I had a student stage just the other day. okay three two one go yeah, I think you raise a good point here. There's a very strong sense of not only chronological, but also spatial claustrophobia fostered by Tolstoy. The structure is just one of the ways in which he, he builds that in the reader, that sense. And I think this is a notion that a lot of uh, modern listeners to this podcast could relate to, because obviously in the quarantine, the COVID crisis and all this stuff, a lot of people have sickness and death on the brain. And a lot of people during uh, this crisis also uh, have had their spatial environments radically shrunk down to a house, sometimes even a room, and their only access is through their computer or something of that sort. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a kind of a timeless novella in a lot of ways, not only in terms of its steam, but in terms of its, to use the, the modern term, which I rather annoys me, relatability um of the characters and what is happening in here there's another way in which i think tolstoy is building this sense of recognition which is that he writes the other characters in ways that foster in us if not, we're not careful an equal dislike and contempt uh ivan's wife is loathsome, loathsome. Uh, his his daughter is maybe even worse uh his uh, colleagues are soulless, soulless and rapacious. But so was he. That's and the thing. Yes, though. yes, no, absolutely. And of course, in making us feel towards them as Ivan feels towards them before the big breakthrough at the end, we realize that we're no better than Ivan. This is not a cautionary tale uh, wagging its finger at us saying, don't be like Ivan. It's rather a pointing story that says you and I are, are Ivan. like Ivan. Yes. yes. And that's, again, that for the reader, that's a bit of a breakthrough moment, I think. Yeah. So it has that, again, I spoke about wisdom. It has that quality that it is not, uh, it's not a, a morality tale in the sense that it's talking about the good people and the bad people. It's talking about all people under the same umbrella of sinners bound for death. Um, yes. and, and, and then it describes the particular type of sinner who happens to be a moral Pharisee. Um, who is a whitewashed sepulchre on the outside he looks great and so do all the people around him they look they're they're healthy they're um, in, moving in the right circles they have the right um, features of their lives that line up to public scrutiny and so forth but within themselves they are decaying uh, 
and morally they uh, they never even ask the right questions let alone know how to treat others properly and and ivan in his uh life illustrates this like he's awful towards his wife his daughter his family in fact he's pretty much awful towards everybody but he gets it back in spades when he is down he finds out uh what they really think of him and they don't think anything of him they want they want everything that he has and that's actually how the story begins at his funeral everyone's thinking i wonder if i'm going to succeed to his position i'm going to get his job now i wonder who's going to move up the corporate ladder now that he, he now that he's out of the way what how is this going to benefit me and his wife is wanting to know whether she's going to benefit from it financially and how yeah, how best she can come out of this there's no high ground where ivan could accuse her uh, posthumously uh of being vain and greedy because he himself lived by the same standards that's why i married her yeah so he's he's uh, he lived his life according to kind of a ruthless materialism uh he married a woman who is dedicated to ruthless materialism they share values um and those values are in savage self. competition self 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 yes it's this is one of the overwhelming senses that you get from reading the novella the entire world seems to be populated by shallow self-serving selfish individuals who are completely bound up in a horrific self-love uh which cuts them off from everybody else around them the the notion of altruistic other-centered love caritas uh is a completely foreign concept in here until we begin to get acquainted with Gerasim. yeah there's no there's no conflict is there it's not that he he feels a tension there between the, how he ought to behave and how he does behave there's no tension at all no and that that's the extraordinary thing and it's also what characterizes the world post 19th century is a lack of attention there is no conflict there they have no sense that they ought to love others more than themselves yes on the contrary they find themselves uh, completely unfulfilled, having attained the things they thought were going to bring them joy. This is a tale as old as time. It's just that modern times have a, a new iteration of the same old story. They have attained the thing they thought was going to bring them peace and joy and contentment and happiness and all these sorts of things. And they found that it does not do so. And they're baffled. And then they need to figure out why they're baffled, what exactly still is lacking. And, uh, We've already begun talking about one of the things. Gerasim uh, is somebody who is an extremely selfless individual. Mm -hmm. And he demonstrates by his actions a care and a love for someone who does not deserve it. And I think that's one of the things that uh, Ivan makes a breakthrough on at the very end. He, is, he sees his son, he sees his wife as he's just about to die. And all of a sudden there's a turn and he pities them. Uh, he cares for them and do they deserve that considering their conduct no but neither did ivan right neither did ivan he's no better but he's no longer a hypocrite he's aware of that about himself so there's an element of certainly remorse but perhaps I, I would argue even repentance on that front he wishes that he had done otherwise they didn't deserve that he pities them he he thinks of them in the same way that god thinks of him now that's not mentioned god is not mentioned again but but and and this is one of the frustrating things about Tolstoy, I think, for me at least, is he seems to be almost there, but he doesn't get there. Um, because unless there's an inter, unless there's a personal God, this idea of personal accountability, this idea of personal uh, integrity, uh, sincerity, those things seem to fall rather flat. Like if it, because he's going to die any, he's going to die anyway. Well, what's the difference whether he lives an authentic life? Well, what does that even mean if there's no afterlife? But but that's the meaning of the black sack. I guess we'll get to that when we get to it. Well, yeah, we oftentimes we begin by talking about the the nature of the author himself or herself, and and we do this right at the beginning of a podcast and. Today, I think uh, we're approaching it rather the other way around here. As I've sure. already said, uh, Tolstoy is de descended from about as highly placed no a nobility as you can in Russia at this point in history. And he lives a life which does not satisfy him. He, as a younger man, he lived a very dissolute life. And then in the middle, there were a series, in the middle of his life, there were a series of crises, spiritual crises, 
and they took him in some unusual directions. He became a pacifist. He became an anarchist. Mm. Um, he brought peasant life to a degree of, I, I think I'm not exaggerating to say, religious veneration. Uh, yes. So much so that he established his own little peasant commune out there. Yes. Yep. And tried to live like a peasant himself, uh, which is a little bit mawkish, if I'm honest. But in any event, so he kind of sacralizes these things. And he's, he gets into some very, very strange spiritual and theological and Christian ideas. Uh, Christianity does inform a lot of his decisions about uh, his spiritual nature, his spiritual life, what he's trying to do. Um, but a lot of the ideas he generates off of that don't look like anything that you or I would conventionally call Christian. Uh, he's, he's a very radical person, and he's continuously experimenting with spiritual notions, artistic notions, the nexus of spirit and art and stuff like this. Yeah, he's pushing in the direction almost of romanticism, really. The, you know, that, that it's, not to, it's not about the child, it's more about the poor. Mm -hmm. so, but, but still pushing the idea of the natural life, the peasant life, uh, as superior to the, 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 the city life, the cultivated life, it's, uh, it's, it's moving that same direction. And, and so while its analysis of the problems of modernity are correct, his solutions, I find, are somewhat lacking. Uh, yeah, as a side note, uh, he wrote a little book towards the end of his life called What is Art? Um, you can read it if you like, but you're going to want that time back on your deathbed. Um, Tolstoy, Tolstoy writes good art, but when he comes to talking about art, and that is not his forte. No, it's funny. Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, your time would be much more profitably spent if you're going to read about the theory of art and the artist uh, from other thinkers on that front. Um, what else do I want to say on this? His wife uh, in his own life also was increasingly exasperated with his decisions about his identity about uh, as a spiritual individual as a christian and as an artist and so they be, uh, their relationship became more and more fractious as it went on i sometimes wonder if there are distant inspired echoes in the character of the wife here in the death of ivan illich with uh, things that he knew by experience in real life another thing i'd like to add on to what you had just said is that because he had grown up in the tremendously compressed and elaborate artificiality of aristocratic life in 19th century Russia, he would have been placed in a position mentally to be much more surprised and shocked by the quote unquote authenticity of peasant life and peasant mentalities and peasant society and things of this sort. You were not, you and I are not placed up that highly that the, the relative difference between inauthenticity of the aristocratic life and the authenticity of the, the people living down at the lower levels wouldn't uh, impress us enough. But it had a shock effect on Tolstoy, who had been largely cut off from that quote unquote authenticity. Yeah. So, yeah, no, there, there so there is very much of a a st social stratification there that has largely been removed um, after a century and a half, really. Certainly after the Russian Revolution, it won't be true in the Soviet Union or now modern Russia either, although I guess there's a new oligarchy based on wealth yes. there. Um, so that, that you're right, that will have struck him personally. And like many epiphanies of sorts uh, for some people, they can overstate the significance of those epiphanies and overstate the, um, uh, the uh, I would say, the uh, advantages of the life that they've never experienced and not really experienced the deprivations of it. And it seems to me Dostoevsky is more of a realist in that sense. Tolstoy remains a bit of an idealist, although his analysis of the problem is correct. He 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 just overstates the or overvalorizes the peasant life. Really, uh, I, I whereas I don't think Dostoevsky does that. He is pushing us more towards a saintly type of figure, um, who often can be seen as a fool in the world's eyes. Now, that's not the same thing. Uh, the the wise fool is a, is a very different thing from the wise peasant. The peasant's not a fool. The peasant's just poor, um, often. Um, and there's an integrity there, but still, it's not the it's not the path of the moral life to become poor. Although, again, in the history of the church, there have been orders that have sought in the monastic life to emulate poverty, and in fact, the 
take it as one of their standards of conduct is to be poor. Um, the mendicant ordinance, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but what the what is striking about the novel is the the way that there's a reversal. There's this the, the paradox in it. So when he is growing in his strength as a young man, and he is his freedom is expanding, so he's traveling more. As his status grows, he's actually spiritually weakening. So his physical strength is marked by spiritual weakness. His freedom of movement is marked by a spiritual bondage. His uh, 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 social status is marked by increased isolation. So the higher he rises, the more he's distanced from everything which is true to him. And that, that also is Tolstoy's analysis is ironically, the higher you go, the better you do, the less uh, aware of what real life is. Now that's part of what you we just said is what draws him to the peasants. They're they're closer to it, but but actually, just because you're poor doesn't mean that you have a greater awareness of of those things either. And that's that's Wordsworth's failure as well. The peasant just because you're a peasant doesn't mean that you're thinking about deep philosophical meaningful things either. Right. No. But, but both of them push it as if it were that, and it's powerful because I think. The contrast is powerful, and it does roughly jibe with the wisdom, uh, wisdom and uh, the wise man and fool dichotomy, which we see as characteristic of all Western literature. Yeah. Um, just a second here. I'm scribbling ideas down before I forget them. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's this notion that, as you say, as Ivan becomes more and more successful at the material and social level. He becomes more and more impoverished at the spiritual level. Um, and of course, this, this gets after this notion of distraction. These things, the social status and material success are very potent, are very intoxicating distractions from the real issue. The fact that he's a, a spiritual creature built for relationship facing death and that this death is coming for him. Um, and I want to also pick up on your point there about the peasant, the noble savage, if you would, to put it in. Yeah, it's almost there. Yeah, he's, he's very close. It's just, in, in my view, it's a new form, uh, a, a very novel uh, Russian form of the noble savage that he's built up for us here. From Forgetting, yourself, yeah. yeah, and we've been doing this since third century BC with the rise of pastoral poetry and the, the idyls and theocritus and people of this sort where we've been sort of celebrating and exploring the worldview of people who live that very sort of close to nature agrarian life. It's true. And, yeah. And we, so this is not, Tolstoy is not doing something new and he's also by way of extension, not making a new mistake potentially. Um, no, it's, we, a, it's also in biblical poetry, same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, you're right. And so there's a sense we tend to forget when we're looking at these people who are living and an genuinely in some ways a much more authentic life sometimes i'm generalizing obviously but nevertheless we tend to forget that sometimes they have not the capacity with which to distract themselves with the material and social climbing in the first place that doesn't make them by default no. somehow better they no. simply haven't had the opportunity if you like to sin as egregiously as an ivan right uh, that's all. If you did give them out that opportunity, would they make the same mistakes Ivan does? Well, since most people make these same mistakes, because this is a, a cautionary tale, not for Ivan or Ivan types, but for all of us, then you would have to say by logical extension, yes, of course. If Gerasim were all of a sudden wealthy and uh, rose in, in social circles as he understood them, would he get distracted from the deeper spiritual concerns? Because otherwise, it's kind of a determinism driving this. If the Yeah, I know, that's right. If the if the peasant is somehow just by placement in the world a better human being, well, the blessed are the poor because they're the poor. Said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Yes. Um, another thing that I found interesting here is that, well, actually, no, I'm of two minds uh, on this notion here. You see very clearly and deliberately and strategically in Crime and Punishment, which we discussed last week, that. The main character, Raskolnikov, undertakes the beginning of the process of sanctification. And in Tolstoy, that's handled rather differently through the plot. 
um, we see uh, the main character resisting and resisting and resisting the breakthrough moment. Of course, you're going to talk out about the black sack here in a little bit, and I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. Um, but we kind of get to the end, and we almost feel that somehow we're there. So in, in many senses, I think Dostoyevsky is very typical of orthodox thinkers when it comes to thinking about sanctification and penance and things of this sort and, and uh, looking at the process, where we don't see that process in the same way in the death of Ivan Illich. Give me your thoughts on that. On the comparison between the two? Yeah, and notions of sanctification. Well, it doesn't seem to be, um, in the case of uh, crime and punishment, there is a progress and there is a sanctification. So there is a uh, more of a process. Here, it the, the breakthrough literally comes in his death. So it's more um, punctual. It's more... It's, it doesn't have a, there's no passage of time to it. There's no sanctification per se. It's more the, it's the meaning of the light because there's a darkness and light motif there as well. Remember the, the sack is black. It's for those of you who uh, want to read it. It's in chapter nine when he's in the final few weeks of his life that we have this dream. And it is a dream of a deep black sack. And it's a sack that he does not want to go into. So I think for the reader, uh, the obvious explanation for what this symbolizes would be death because he's wanted to avoid death his whole life and the black sack he's being thrust down and he doesn't want to that would be death I presume that would be the most obvious um, interpretation there he's pushed at the same time he wants to fall into it and so there's an element in there and this is this part of the psychological profundity I think of Tolstoy is there is a sense in which he wants to avoid it now that's the part of him that's always wanted to avoid it and then there's an element which has awoken in him which actually wants to embrace it and wants to turn towards it and that's the part that is that has grown and emerged and it's it's not going to come up afterwards as in raskolnikov where he he throws himself at uh uh, his beloved's feet and and weeps and breaks down and so forth and then finally moves from uh, this false confession to a sort of an authentic life it's now he's finally facing death for the first time and when he does so and he cooperates with this uh, whatever is pushing him into the black bag at that point he breaks through the black sack and that's interesting it's at the point where he no longer turns away from it that he not only gets there but gets through it and that's because he sees hidden in death something meaningful there. And it was hidden by death. And that's why he didn't look at it. He didn't want to face it. But once he faces it, he sees that on the other side of death, there's a light and it's life. And he gets pushed through it. The second time he gets pushed right through that and into that. And so in a sense, while the bag black sack represents death, it could be and, and some people have suggested this, and I sort of hate it because it seems like Freudian, a little Freudian to me. It's a womb of sorts mm. because he comes out and he goes into it. He comes out of that womb into as one emerges from the womb to the light, to life. So there's a new birth, as it were, in his death. And, and so that at least is symbolized there. I think you can see something of that. Uh, but there's a, it, it, Tolstoy does not expand on that. And I think. That's why I think the, the idea that the sack is a womb is a little bit stretched, to be honest. But but the new life, I, I'll grant that. There is a sense of life that comes with the light. There isn't a sense that the, the sack is a womb, per se. I do agree new life, uh, uh, life as we experience it, comes from the womb, for sure. But spiritual life in Christian terms is not going back into the womb. It's It's rather being given a spiritual dimension to your life uh, an enhancement of everything that was true about you, which you didn't have before, but it doesn't mean going back into your mother's womb. In fact, that's what um, Nicodemus asked Jesus when he said you needed to be born again. You know, am I to go back into my mother's womb? Ha ha ha. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, you know, says, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know this? You need to be born again, Nicodemus. Yeah. But what does that mean exactly? What is the what is the nature of the new birth? That's I think what Tolstoy is talking about here is sort of a new birth. Yeah. Um, 
the light is interesting because of course in some senses he does make a breakthrough both literally and figuratively at the end here the light is obviously associated deeply 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 with uh, christian notions of god uh, and the light was good always light etc uh, etc et yeah and we've talked about this uh, around numerous authors previously so this is not really a new thing um I don't like you. I don't like this notion that it's like a return to the womb or something like this, because it smacks, as you say, of things Freudian, which always makes me nervous. Um, it also has this sort of notion of birth and then return and then rebirth. And are we getting into the dynamics of reincarnation or where, where exactly is this conversation going to go? Uh, I, I don't know that that's necessarily the most productive direction um but to be fair to be fair there's nothing in the story that forbids that because this is one of the things i say that frustrates me a bit about tolstoy is the lack of clarity on that point yeah what a lot of people might not know about tolstoy also is that he was a massive massive influence on mahatma gandhi uh and uh notions about pacifism okay so three two one go yeah and readers might be forgiven for sensing something akin to eastern mysticism around some of tolstoy's thinking uh, much of his writing nonfiction as well uh what people might not know is that Tolstoy was a very considerable influence upon mahatma gandhi uh not just in terms of his pacifism uh, and uh, his uh, identity as an anarchist by the way tolstoy is considered an anarchist because he thought that the natural trajectory of any governmental structure was to lead to conflict and war sooner or later and since he was a pacifist who rejected that he must also reject governmental structures and things of that nature thus anarchist mm -hmm. in any event um it is true there is something sort of again to make up terms here new agey about some of the thinking of tolstoy especially as he gets on in years his big years of shifting worse um 1868 69 70 and this is written well into the 1880s 1886, i think it was so he's deeply into his spiritual personal spiritual revolution uh during the writing of the death of ivan illich the black sack also i should mention is uh, a symbol which has become famous in western literature it is referenced in music it is referenced in other works of literature it's referenced in movies so when somebody starts talking about the black sack they likely mean the black sack of death as articulated by tolstoy in the death of ivan illich yeah no and and we said that you just said he was rather heterodox i mean he was excommunicated by the orthodox church for that matter so he, you know <laughs> uh, I mean, when he and he really did see the Sermon on the Mount as the essence of Christianity. Yeah, and he believed that in a very literal sense. He was very there. literal sense. So literally, you ought to prostrate yourselves before your enemy. And, uh, you know, can you imagine, uh, I, I'm trying to think of a, an analogy. Um, go present yourselves to the Islamic State and, and let them do to you what, what they will that's that's the essence of tolstoy's position um on this and no doubt they would have then um is this is this really what jesus taught his followers to do most would say no <laughs> yeah but of course the the notion of pacifism makes nonsense of many of our article uh, arguments as we enter into this so it, it becomes very difficult very vexed very quickly and of course another thing that's going to uh, there's many things which popularize Tolstoy's writings, but one of them is his aggressive pacifism, almost speaking out prophetically before the mind numbing apocalypse of the Great War. And uh, Tolstoy is read rather differently after the Great War uh, than he was before. And uh, by the way, as a side note again, when i read war and peace uh, i found it surprising and interesting that the translation of war and peace that i read was uh translated in russia by uh, i'm not exactly sure who it was but it was in 1940 so literally months before the germans invaded russia was when that translation was produced but in any event um yeah 
before we leave it behind, let's come back to the, his vexed double notion about- In which enemy. case the Russians ought to have thrown themselves before the Germans and let the Germans, yeah. There you go, yeah. And yeah. let the Nazis do what they will. Mm. Um, but I wanna come back to this thing that you mentioned, which I think is valuable. This notion that, of course, he resists with all of his might being thrust into the black sack of death. And the note, so he's resisting it. And yet another part of his mind wants to get. Right, so that's the thing. There are two selves there, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, and you have this this authentic spiritual self, which wants in. And you have this inauthentic material self, which resists with all its might. And the the latter of these two has to be defeated before he can make it in there and sees the bright light and he needs to die to himself in order to be born again yeah basically yeah yeah this is yeah precisely um and so this is as you say this is the breakout that he he makes um it also the inevitability of his death and the fact that he was not dealing with uh questions of meaning and purpose in life in the face of death is also again highlighted right at the beginning because garasim says rather shockingly right at the beginning he said they were talking is uh, such a sad affair, et cetera, et cetera. And they mentioned this in passing to Gerasim. It's another one of these artificial throwaway comments. And Gerasim responds authentically. Well, everybody dies. Well, actually, yeah, that's going to be our organizing principle right at the front end of the story. So Tolstoy doesn't mess around. He doesn't waste time. Everyone dies. So what? What are you going to do about it? Uh, how, how do you actually answer that? I, I said that Gerasim, I don't like the idea of the black sock as a womb. What I do find interesting is that Gerasim is presented something akin to being a midwife. Like he has on the couch, he's got he's got uh, Ivan down, and he's pushing his legs back and forth, like to trying to relieve alleviate the, his his pain. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like uh, again helping a midwife helping a woman give birth, and the birth what she would give he would give birth to in the case of Ivan is a different sense of himself, and and Ivan is moved by the fact that this man is going to do things for him that nobody in his family would do. Like he's literally a stranger and yet he treats him and loves him as if he were his brother uh, or his father or somebody uh, associated with him in a familial way. And, and that so moves him that it, and the, and the contrast with his wife could not be starker. She can hear him, she says, through three shut doors. That's how terrible his pain was. <laughs> so she's describing the horror of his pain, but she's describing it as unendurable for her, which he couldn't shut out even through three shut doors. That's how bad his pain was that she could still hear. Okay, but really she's complaining that the do shut doors wouldn't stop it, her from experiencing uh, his terrible agony. And contrast that with Gerasim, um, whose name it seems to me sounds a bit like the Gerasim demoniac, so he's crazy in the eyes of the world. Remember, he's the man that Jesus cast the demons out of and they went into the swine and so forth. He seems to be, by the standards of Ivan, when we first meet him, a man who is insane. This is a man he's possessed uh, of, a, of a different spirit. And yet the spirit is the one that that uh, Ivan himself embraces in the end. And he and he loves this man. He breaks down. He does so with his family as well. He weeps. Uh, he asks, he, he pities them, he sees them, he sees they don't know how to deal with his death either because they've never been prepared for it and they, in the way that he wasn't prepared to face it. And so he, he actually pities them. And that's really interesting. So there's a spiritual progression in there, um, which I do think mirrors that of the story we just talked about, crime and punishment, and yet it, its trajectory is very, very different. There's no sanctification going on here per se. It's more awareness of the meaning of new life. Yeah. If Ivan did anything in his old life, which is more or less 99.9% .9 of it, if he did something good and kind, it was always because it was operating within the dynamics of reciprocation. Yep. He wanted something back from it. Mm -hmm. And at the Quid end, quo. Yep. he finally feels something for someone which he can't, uh, which cannot be reciprocated because he dies a moment later. He's gone. There's no object to receive anything back from it. It's the, it's the first moment of genuine spiritual selflessness that Ivan shows. It's the last moment as well. I 
also remember when I first read this novella, I was obviously I was disgusted by the wife throughout. Um, and particularly at the point where you're talking about this, his death is this horrible inconvenience for her. And the daughter is the same thing. The daughter wants to go out and immerse herself in material life. But, you know, I've got, you know, kind of held back by my father dying awkwardly. Um, but this is a situation of Ivan's own making again. Ivan, because his wife is, his relationship with his wife is bad. And because she's vexing to him in various ways, he immerses himself increasingly in his work. He immerses himself in public life and neglects domestic life, allowing the rot at home to fester even more instead of dealing with it in, uh, in a way that's healthy. And so if his wife is being an awful human being at the end here, it's only because this is a garden, if you like, that Ivan himself has planted. He's just reaping what he has sown. Um, he's never made an attempt to actually make a real genuine connection and build up his wife and build up that relationship. Uh, so he's, you know, he's not innocent on those fronts either. He bears the full guilt for everything that is happening to him. Yeah, he, a line from uh, the book, his duty, he considered whatever was to, to, to cons his duty, he considered whatever was so considered by those persons who were set in authority over him. So it's not that he saw a moral law. He not, he didn't recognize any sort of sense of obligation of right and wrong it was just whatever pleased those in authority over him that was what his duty was so in other words he was an immoral man uh, and he was to some degree an amoral man he recognized yeah, I, no moral law that's, I, the, that's the essence of the problem here yeah i think that second part is is very much more to the point he's amoral his his uh, morals are entirely arbitrary based on mere instrumental convenience to himself and that's whatever serves that aspect of uh, of his of his life is what he's going to set up as kind of an idol of morality and ethics and things of that sort yeah and that this is an issue which tolstoy touches on which will grow in its significance over the course of the 20th century uh, and c.s lewis will write on it in the abolition of man as one of the most serious uh concerns of modern the modern world namely the abandonment of moral uh the moral law in education the idea that there is such a, th a thing as right and wrong and it needs to be inculcated in the young he says that educators have utterly abandoned that I, the very notion of it has been abandoned uh as as irrelevant as subjective and is effectively meaningless uh lewis says if that is so then we are no longer educators, we are conditioners. We, we treat our children as if they were experimental guinea pigs. Uh, we do to them things that we would never consider to do to ourselves because there, is no, there are no tram lines to constrain us from our actions towards others. He sees that as characteristic of the educational uh, establishment of his day. It is that much more so uh, in our day, I would say. So this is the problem. So when we're talking about literature here and the great work that the death of Ivan Illich is, it really is a diagnostic into the soul of our own culture. Yeah, and there, there was pushback against this during the Victorian period against this sort of mindless materialism, this, uh, this relativism. Uh, but one of the things you and I have talked about here right at the beginning was the denial, the denial of death. It's, it's like he's, it's not that he thinks he's going to somehow avoid the problem or what have you or it does he willfully tries not to think about the problem of death and i would argue that he's also probably being quite willful in his uh refusal to think personally individually and genuinely about what constitutes the good he uh as with the the mannerisms as with the methods of moving in society aping them as he did before so also with morality he apes morality and when we move into season four, which is going to be with the next podcast, next podcast. we're going to be moving uh, rapidly towards the 20th century. We've got some authors in there who grapple with this head on. One of the authors uh, is Flannery O'Connor. Uh, and if you've ever read her short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, you'll know that the main character is somebody who lives her lives by purely by shallow spiritual and moral cliches. And it comes out in her language. And it gets debunked as it got debunked by 
for Ivan by the imminent crisis of looming death. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a similar approach. So there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to writing on this motif. Um, there are rather different and illuminating approaches to this this issue. Do you have anything more to say about Tolstoy or the death of Ivan Illich here, Bill? I think we've, uh, you know, we, we could talk about this ad infinitum, but I think we've laid out at least the beginning of most of the major threads of the novella as I see it. So I'm yeah. well content. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting that the narrator is, as it were, omniscient. Um, that's still interesting. Um, it's probably necessary for the uh, type of novel it is, or the type of work it is, to be presented ably. It's about wisdom. It's universal. Of course, it needs to be omniscient. Then this is not a subjective opinion of perspective. Yeah. Um, we're going to see when we move to the 20th century that the degrees of omniscience um, depart from us. We'll start to get subjective vantage points. We'll get very limited viewpoints. Uh, in the case of Conrad, the other novella, which is a great novella, Heart of Darkness, we'll see it conclude with who knows what. We're not exactly sure how it ends or even if it ends. <laughs> Those become increasingly characteristic as the uh, relativism sets its uh, uh, itself into the culture and its viewpoints. But uh, let's leave off with that. I did want to add, um, I'm working on a, a website for the uh, Paideia today. It should come out within the next month or so. And I hope that we will be able to start featuring uh, some masterclasses in days ahead, but we'll feature all of the past websites on it and other details, but stay tuned for that. And we'll definitely deal with that in season four. Uh, but for now, I think that's it for us today, Bill. Uh, I'm Dr. Scott Masson with, again, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Bill Friesen, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.